Hello everyone and welcome to um, Season 3, Episode 11. Today we're going to deep dive into ageing. So that's everything to do with ageing, um, the details of physiological effects of ageing, the psychological effects of ageing and just how we, re we relate to ageing in uh, society. Uh, so good deep dive, as I said, we've got two great guests. Um, we've got Andy Lane, who's um, is Professor Andy Lane, I should say, who's an exercise um, psychologist. Um, as also a general expert in all things exercise, but uh, he's an um, associate dean of Wolverhampton University. And then we've got Andy, sorry, we've got Greg White, who's uh, also a professor, double professor today. They've been guests on before. So Greg is um, a big fundraiser for the BBC and Comic Relief. He's done loads of things with those. Um, he's an expert um, on exercise psychology and performance. Um, former Olympian himself and um, sports scientist, obviously. So we get into some big details. Um, also, just some really interesting little factoids that I didn't even know about. So um, hope you enjoy and um, over to them. OK, welcome. Andy Lane and Greg White, the professors. Thanks for joining me again. I do really appreciate your, uh, your time. Um, so we're, um, we're chatting today about ageing, the thing that happens to all of us, whether we like it or not, and um, a little bit about what it is, and you know, apart from the obvious, um, and then a bit more detail, a bit of a deep dive into what happens to the brain and to the body. And then also at the end, we're going to talk about what we can actually do to prevent um, the, the sudden drop off and... Um, and decrepitude that often happens and then what we can do the, the easy things um the the low-hanging fruit really to to stop that uh, in its tracks that'd be good wouldn't it find a fountain mm -hmm. of youth so um how do we def how do we define aging to start with anyway apart from the obvious chronological thing is it what's what starts to happen in the body let's um let's let's go with that first but uh, perhaps i'll kick off on this i mean mm -hmm. I, I, you know for me Effectively, what we've got, I mean, it's an interesting one because we talk about it at both ends of the spectrum, this difference mm. between between what we call chronologic age, so in other words, the number of years versus yeah. the versus the biologic age. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anybody who's listening who's got kids or anybody who can remember back to when they were at school uh, and you walk out as a year seven onto the rugby pitch. <laughs> and, there, and there was always that one kid who played tight head prop who at, at the age of 11. Had, a beard. had chest chest hair, a beard, and was built like Big Daddy. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we had one of those. And, yeah. and, you know, and the, the interesting thing about that is actually, you know, there's been much talk around the sort of education sector for a number of years now about, you know, should, what what should we do in terms of, of sort of school sport? Should we have it so that it is biologically driven, so it's biologic age, so therefore you've got people of equal stature. So in terms of strength, aerobic capacity, mobility, all of those things in terms of fits or globally fitness and put them all together. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's because effectively what, what, what we see is that that maturation process occurs uh, at a different stage for different people. We, you know, those with kids will know that, that some kids mature much younger. So girls get their mentees at a much younger age than others and, yeah. and, and physical maturation, et cetera. Um, and, and, and interesting enough, as we move through life, um, that that ageing process, and, and you know, I mean, if you look at Andy and I, we're of a similar age. Um, we're both twenty-seven. Still um, still coming on. And, and we look like you know we've been beaten by the ugly stick on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, but, but, but oh dear. You, often what you'll do is you'll compare yourself to others, and, and you'll meet other people who are the same age as you who look significantly older act significantly older but actually in terms yeah. of their functional capacity appear significantly older and so yeah. therefore what's going on there is their, their chronologic age dictating their their capacity their functional capacity their their look their aesthetic actually it's biologic age and so what yeah. you can get is a, is a, a, the rate of aging can change and that rate of aging is associated with a whole host of different things um but, you know, if we want to get technical, one of the key drivers to it is this thing called telomere length. Do you want to, uh -huh. do you want to go, do you want to go that you, far into it? You started that because I've got that on my list of, because um, it's something I've heard a lot about. And I, if I'm honest, I don't fully understand it. But um, I know it's a, it's at a, almost a genetic level, isn't it? So it's 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 on the DNA side. So maybe if you can dive into that, that would be helpful. Well, yeah, tell you know what, we, we've, we've published a whole host of work in, in this area, particularly around immune function. 
So I, I guess the one thing you have to remember is that a, a cell, uh, if, if you remember, effectively the body is made up of cells uh, and, and those cells have a lifespan. Um, so they have a functional lifespan for which they deliver a job. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and so think about this in, the, in a workplace scenario. So you, people come into the job uh, and, and they've got a period of time that they're going to be functional in that job. Yeah. And then at the end of that job, what you're hoping is that, that what they have done is that they've trained people <laughs> to take over their job once they retire. Yeah. Okay. Now, in a cell sense, what you're talking about there is you're talking about this cell being able to replicate. So effectively, what it can do is take itself and then replicate itself over and over again. So if you take an immune cell, a T, a T lymphocyte, for example, what it, what it does is it knows that at some stage what, what, there is turnover so so we're destroying them at a given rate and so what we've got to do is we've got to produce them at a given rate to keep that stable yeah okay uh, and 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 so therefore when when the cell is healthy what it can do is it can replicate it can replicate itself and produce new cells okay yeah but in in doing that as part of this dna on the chromosome you've got this thing called a telomere at the end of it it's like the tail of it okay and every time it replicates that tail gets slightly shorter Ah, okay. okay. And as that as that tail gets shorter, eventually it reaches in honor of the of the guy that 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 sort of founded and proposed this hypothesis. It reaches what's called the the Hayflick limit, right? Um, and at that point, what then happens is is that now this cell still functioning, it's still functioning, but what it can't do is it can't replicate. Right. Okay. And and not being able to replicate means that what that cell becomes is this wonderful word called senescent. senescent. So the, the, the cell becomes senescent. So you, you've got this cell which is operating, it's working. And, and, and to some extent, it's much like it, it's much like, you know, as we as we near retirement, we get to the age where actually we, we just we're not we're not we're not sort of producing anything else at the back end of it. And we're just about to retire. Yeah, that's the point. At, 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 so the at cell's course. kind of checked out. <laughs> it's, it's sort it's sort of checked out. It's still sort of floating around, still doing a job. But, it, but yeah. what, what it can't do, it, it's not adding to the system. And, okay. and, and the interesting thing about that, if we want to, you know, let's talk some sexy language. What it will then do is it will then send a through the cell membrane. It will send a signal to signal that it is senescent. And, and one of the things that we looked at, you know, in T lymphocytes, for example, is we looked at what's called KLRG1, which is a cell surface glycoprotein which is wonderfully big words, which basically says, look, it, it pokes something out of the cell membrane to say, I'm, I'm senescent. Right. Uh, and, and what we can do is we can actually measure the number of senescent cells that we see as they go around. Okay. I see. Right. Now, the, now, the interesting thing about that is, is that the number of senescent cells, it, we've got senescent cells all the time throughout life. Okay. But what, what tends to happen as we get older is that the number of senescent cells gets bigger and bigger and bigger and grows. Okay. Yeah. Now that, that, that fundamentally is aging. Right. But for me, the interesting thing is that, that, there, that what we can, what we have the capability to do is we can accelerate that aging. Right. So for example, things that are really potent in accelerating that things like inflammation. Right. Um, so, and, yeah. and so anything that causes chronic inflammation, and that can range from things like smoking through to uh, excessive sunlight exposure through to obesity. Then what that will do is that that will accelerate the rate of aging. OK, yeah. now because we can accelerate it, what we can also do by intervention, what we can do is we can slow that rate of aging. Right. Uh, and, and so anything that is fundamentally uh, there are obviously other factors, but anything that's anti-inflammatory. So a great example of that is physical activity. Yeah, really potent anti-inflammatory uh, approach. Then what what physical activity exercise will do is it will actually slow that rate of aging. Right. Got you. And, and, that, and that's why uh, through life, what we get is we get this difference between chronologic age and biologic age because it's based upon how we have affected that rate of aging. Right, gotcha. Well, that's a pretty good sum up of aging. Thank you very much. So, um, <laughs> well, that that's done. That's that's done. we'll just wrap it up there, shall we? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, yeah. So, the, the, the weird kind of question I had was is, are we designed to live a certain length of time? Because obviously, when we can't father any more kids and when we can't produce any more babies, we're kind of 
redundant anyway in, in terms of uh, in terms of evolutionary so are we kind of just on the on the genetic scrap heap then if you like do you know what i mean just just kind of kicking around so that was that was one of the things are we are we designed to li actually live this long into our 90s really or is it just down to to, to drugs and 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 you know the fact that we don't have to run away from tigers anymore and sh you know stuff like that you, you see what i mean yeah so is the, what, what, Andy? go on well look, the, the the um your your evolutionary arguments would say that once you've reproduced your role is 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 minimal is yeah minimal. um however when you, look, I mean, the data on age is quite interesting because it, it, yes, average li average life expectancy is, is increasing, but that's as much to do with the um, number of people dying in their youth declining, as it is people living longer. When you start looking at the the average age of someone who is 60 in around about 1910 or something, that ha you know, if, if you're if you get to 60, your chances of getting to 75 are pretty good. Right. They, so th those figures haven't shifted as far as the average has oh and, i see yeah and it's so interesting right. just to... jump in there quick because yeah. this is something that i read a while ago about and maybe you can clear this up then is that you used to hear these things oh you people in you know in the when they were cavemen used to live to 30 and that was it that was the average age but that's that's kind of a bit of a of a confusion isn't it because they used to take in child mortality mortality rates so yeah. such high child mortality rates used to skew those numbers so that it, it was actually nonsense the the average age was always you know, for adults, if you like, was in the still in the 60s, 70s and 80s, whatever. But it's just there were so many children dying that it brought the the, the net average down. Is that is well, that kind of right? Uh, that and you think of the you think of illnesses and issues that could kill people that we've yeah. got, you know, um, that we, we we can now stop that. So your risk, you, you, you run the risk of hitting some of those as long as you go on, which no, yeah. no longer are the case. Yeah. So. Childhood is one, and you know J Japan is. We, you know, they're lot long livers, but they don't have many children anymore. They're yeah. closing schools by the by the shed load. It's funny so enough, that, I'm talking about that later. Chinese. Yeah, well, it's, Sorry, the the, it's kind of it's, you're looking in to see if there's a difference in their, um, if, if there's a difference in how people live their lives and so on and so forth. And you, yeah. and you start coming back to what it's, it's sort of playing with the numbers here a little bit, but um, the. the uh, not it's not necessarily that people you know if evolution has let has 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 allowed people to live for a great long period of time and that's prospered and so if you can get if you if you partly through luck would have been previously but your ability to mm. be to, to miss to not stand on a nail or stand on some metal and get get tetanus well without a cure for, without the tetanus but jab what happens to you yeah dead but so on. well <laughs> exactly uh uh, I, tell, so, I, tell, I, I tell you what's interesting in, in of that, though, is that if, if you take a look at the data, sort of current data, what you see is that there's a very strong relationship between socioeconomic status and length of yeah, life. Yeah. Yeah. Is if, if you are poor, you are you, you will live a shorter life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so you know, it, it comes back to this sort of aging process uh, is that it, it, the, the, there's that rate of aging. You know, if you can't afford high quality nutrition, you know, if, if your diet is is poor, yeah. Um, if you can't heat your house, yeah. Um, if you if you if you don't get the recovery that's required because you don't sleep well because actually th there are too many people living in your house and you're hot bedding, etc. Or you're you working know, twelve I mean, hours a day. <laughs> well, you know, and, and 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 actually stress is exceptionally high because yeah. you're much more worried about income and 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 looking after chill, etc. etc. Yeah. So all of those things can lead to this to this. I mean, it, 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 I mean, it's an interesting one in the sense that we, you know we talk about aging, but actually, what something that what we're talking about is 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 what we call acquired diseases. So those diseases mm. which are acquired associated with lifestyle. So things like um, things like coronary atherosclerosis, which which leads to, to heart attack. We're talking about stroke. We're talking yeah. about cancer. Um, we talk about diabetes, which then leads to other factors. You know, all of those things. So, so I, I think it, what's interesting is it is multifactorial. I mean, one of the reasons why we have we have improved length of life compared to cavemen is because of is because of lifestyles lifestyle has changed which is which is positive which re reduces that rate of age and reduces the, mm. the the prevalence of of disease which then leads to shortening of life mm. add on top of that medical care and and the role of, of pharmacology but just medicine in general and then actually add on top of that now what we talk about you know the role of physical activity promotion of health promotion of diet 
of yeah. stress reduction, of reduction in alcohol, all of those things lead to a reduction in aging, a reduction in, in the, the uh, creation of, of, uh, of acquired diseases, and mm. so therefore an improved length of life. Right. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, the, the, the caveman diet, which might be popular, um, uh, uh, is not, not I, wouldn't, I wouldn't confuse that with um, actually having what, the, what their diet would be. It's basically a natural product. And yeah. that's actually typically a good thing. And I hear how people take these and take these to extreme. Yeah, exactly. Go, well, actually, no, you need a bit of cautious there. What that's really saying is you don't eat processed food because there's no processed food in caveman times. Yeah. But life was fairly desperate. You slept on the floor. You slept in the <laughs> yeah. outside. You were cold. You had to, and so on. And that's what, and uh, don't get, don't, don't move yourself off from what the reality was. Um, yeah. Yeah. With, with the whole paleo thing for me, the, the big thing there, the big stumbling block, why I'd, I'd kind of call bullshit on most of it is because they didn't have the foods that we have now. I mean, it, all these things have been engineered over millennia and decades to look completely different and to provide completely different nutrition than they did back then anyway. So you didn't get you didn't get a tomato or a or an apple like you did back then. I mean, there were horrible little crab apple things that used to <laughs> just be horrendous. So, you know, you didn't have the foods that you could eat. You couldn't eat paleo even if you wanted to, is my point. No. Because yeah, things have changed. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, and, and, things, and, things, and things have changed. And I think also what we have to always remember is that we have this lovely, we put this wonderful gloss mm. over the fact that apparently cavemen, because they, they were on a paleo diet, they had the most wonderful quality of life, apparently. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know, they didn't they didn't get rickets. Yeah, uh, because, because they were micronutrient deficient. Or riddled uh, they with didn't parasites. Get, they didn't get scurvy or riddled with parasites or or actually get a cold and die from it. Yeah. You know, from a very simple virus. Yeah. You know, so I, I think you know, it's how it's how we reflect on it, really. And that fundamentally yeah. is based around the fact that uh, it depends how much money you're going to make out the sale of your new book. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, and what you don't want to do is let the facts get in the way of a good story. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. A new recipe, paleo recipe book. So if we talk about things more, more mechanical things now, um, like things like your your joints, um, bone density, hormone, the, how, how hormones drop off for men and women. Um, it's it's a bit more sudden with women, but with men, it's more of a gradual decline, isn't it? Especially talking talk about sex hormones here, really. Um, and and then alongside that, the reduction in muscle mass um, and strength. So. Um, so what what really triggers that? I mean, if we you can look at both sexes, but you see the effect is similar anyway, isn't it? It's a bit more sudden with women on the old osteoporosis front, I think. So, um, so what happens there? Well, so I mean, it's interesting because obviously now in common parlance, something that we would never be allowed to talk about. Three men on a podcast, um, you know, a couple of decades ago, would never be allowed to talk about menopause. No, um, but but now it, but now it's very much part of common parlance and, 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 yeah. and understanding the impact of, of menopause and the, the 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 rapid, relatively rapid reduction in in estrogen uh, yeah. and associate and associated hormones, which then r require intervention and support, etc. Um, we've got a much better understanding of it, and certainly I wouldn't necessarily say a better understanding. But we've certainly got a, be a, a, a better conversation. Yeah, you know, going over it that everybody is is joined into. It was just taboo, so. wasn't it? Strange. Mm. <laughs> of course, yeah. And, and, and mm. as many things are, sadly, when we talk about health, you know, mm. um, you know, I mean, I wrote a book on pregnancy. Well, a man wasn't allowed to talk about pregnancy. I mean, mm. are you crazy? Because a man doesn't get pregnant. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and yet now, obviously, and, you know, the irony being that so many um, obs and gynae specialists are men. But um, so, uh, so it's an inter interesting one. And, and I think to some extent, at the same at the same time what we're not, we're not allowed to talk about is what happens to men yeah uh, and, and and we know that men go through this thing called uh, variably um defined uh, and 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 uh and titled but andropause or somatopause yeah um where, where what we see with men is that we see a, a reduction in growth hormone yeah uh, alongside that reduction in growth hormone we see a, a reduction in uh, testosterone um and, and, and I, I think to some extent, the interesting thing is that the, 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 the reduction in male or female sex hormones, the reduction in growth hormone drive very similar responses in men and women. And, and yeah. that is, you know, classically things that we see, for example, I mean, it, it's amazing what happens with aging, but, you know, VO2 max, for example. So our yeah. aerobic, our aerobic capacity drops, you know, somewhere in the region about four to five mils per kg per minute per decade. 
Oh, right. Um, okay. As we go through. Now, when does that start? Generally, that starts around the sort of mid 30s, interestingly yeah. enough, where we don't think we're old in, the, in our mid 30s. Yeah. So that, and, and this will come on to what we talk about later about, you know, when should we intervene? But it, it's that mid 30s period where we start to see this gradual reduction. And what we see with things like uh, the menopause, for example, let, let me give you a good example, because this is the area that, I, I, that, that I've created this. this uh, sports nutrition company around is something like collagen yeah is that that collagen reduces um, and collagen is a, a structural protein really really important particularly for soft tissue so muscle tendon ligament and articular surfaces but it, it reduces generally from from sort of the age of the mid 30s maybe slightly younger in some people by one percent per year right. but for a woman it goes through menopause it reduces by 30 percent Bloody hell. Almost in, instantaneously through menopause. Right. So so I think what we have to be really careful of is confusing the fact that aging only occurs at menopause or andropause. And um, actually, aging starts much, much before that. And what andropause and menopause do is that they accelerate that process of aging. Right. OK, for sure. So it's it's yeah, it's down to the, the, the drop off of, of the sex hormones that triggers those kind of reactions. So how much well, bone loss they, do we they have? They accelerate it at that time, and, and, yeah. But it is on, it's ongoing. Sort it's of going general anyway. attrition over time, yeah. So I've heard some statistics about um, the amount of bone loss we we get per year. You might be able to shed some light on that as well. But it's it's almost it's relevant. It's, it's going to change with each individual person, obviously. But there's quite a lot of bone loss as well, isn't it? As well as muscle mass, um, you know, over 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 those early years, like the thirties, forties, and then into fifties. So I mean, we'll go on to how you can prevent that later on, but it's um, it is quite surprising, it's quite surprising how much actual calcium leaves the body. Well, I think what's interesting here, okay, what's really interesting here, bone is eighty percent protein. Yeah. You know, and what what we we've got this sort of again sort of this dogma that, that resides around bone that bone is is all it is is calcium, calcium yeah. phosphate, and so therefore that's all that matters. And what we've got to do is replenish calcium. Well, look, I can tell you, you know, having worked in elite sport and, and Andy and I worked you know, for a very long time in elite sport is that the, the one thing that we deal with, particularly with female athletes, but actually uh, more latterly. And, we, and so yeah. we've redefined it. We used to call it the female athlete triad, which is very closely. linked. And the reason why you know, Andy and I work on, in this area is because it's very closely linked physiology and psychology mm -hmm. in, in, right. in what generates the female athlete triad. Um, but we reported back in the, the early 2000s into late 90s, early 2000s, that we were identifying the same thing in, in male athletes. Right. Um, and so, and, and now it's been redefined in what we call Red S, Reduced Energy Deficiency Syndrome. So Red S is, is sort of the, the replacement of that. But what we know is that what's interesting is that with people who have very, very high training loads, um, but calorie restrict, because what they're looking for is to reduce weight because obviously lighter is faster. Yeah. But then what you've got is you've got this imbalance between consumption and expenditure in terms of, of energy. Uh, and, and that has a, a profound impact. So in women, what it does is it causes a loss of uh, a reduction in estrogen. It can cause a disturbance in the menstrual cycle. Um, and that can move from what's called eumenorrhea, normal menses, into oligomenorrhea. So it, can, it becomes sporadic or they right. can become amenorrheic. They lose yeah, their menses completely. And at the same time, you get reduction in muscle in bone mineral density. Right. And that that process is called osteopenia. Oh, right. OK. Now, now the interesting thing is that that menopausal post menopausal, this rapid reduction in, in estrogen can lead to a process called uh, called osteoporosis. Yeah. OK. Now, the interesting thing for athletes is if you come into menopause with low bone mineral density in an osteopenic state, yeah. Then what you wow. do is you exacerbate that postmenopause, yeah. and so you become osteoporotic much more rapidly because you're starting mm. at a lower level. Right. Got you. Um, that makes sense. But the interesting thing is that the same the same occurs for men. Is that you know we've reported on a number of uh, male endurance athletes in particular with low BMDs in non non load bearing bones. So yeah. generally, what you see in in running athletes, for example. BMD in hip and, and femur tend to be okay, but if you take a look at radial BMD, right. it's dreadful. It's, you know, it's, it's really low. So, yeah. so it, it, it's an, it, again an interesting process, which yes, accelerated at those time points of menopause, etc. But you, 
our lifestyles can affect it significantly prior to that point, which then has a profound impact on outcome and therefore aging. Uh, okay. And and when they when the athletes so focused on their weight, um, and the weight goes down, and they they believe that to be good, they're not seeing that actually much some of that weight loss as bone in essence. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, which is actually, which is long term derogatory, if it, but it might get a short term snappy good performance. So that positive reinforcement from trying to do things and getting better uh, can have really detrimental long term effects on health. Right. Um, the, the sort of, I mean, and that would occur in the you, you, you're a motivated athlete and it might get on to having a, the, falling off the cliff in terms of performance at some point. Yeah, and and that you know we talk about motive, you know we talk about people trying to keep active late and older, but that deterioration in performance and that social comparison is so important to people that not being as good as what you were just puts you off. Yeah, and, and therefore you... you've you've yeah. you've affected the. I mean, if you're you're in that position, you've affected your actual structure by reducing the amount your, your your bones. And uh, and then you stop doing physical activity, and so you can you start to gain weight. Your the, ex, the extent to which you can rapidly age in terms of everything that goes wrong is colossal. So is that why often you'll see you'll see kind of elite level athletes really falling off the wagon, you know, in terms of like you know really you know I hate to use the term letting themselves go, but you know what I mean. You, sometimes you'll look at someone, you know, five to five ten years after they've stopped competing or whatever, and you think, wow, you know, you you've not looked after yourself. So is it would that be down to the fact that they've just lost? motivation to do it it's um you know the, the, um certainly that used to be the 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 um response previously a lot more than it is now yeah and particularly less of it, like boxers right? they used to be enormously overweight yeah um, the uh and there's now more of a uh, uh an awareness of having to keep healthier but i mean for the higher level sport you go the more your self-esteem gets wrapped up in your success the, you're on the public spotlight for doing the doing that activity and you're no you'd suddenly get off that spotlight there's an encouragement to retire and yeah and you if you have retired your your self-esteem your ego is no longer in the sport um but that doesn't quite sit when you physically feel you really can be in the sport so getting yourself un, out of shape is kind of really i'm not ready to compete anymore which yeah. kind of how the boxers would get themselves out of the mindset of ready to being ready to compete um, but it's a, it's a it's a relatively dangerous path to go along. I mean, we'll yeah. get a bit that hopefully a bit more later. But the um, uh, motivation, keeping you keeping having goals, and being really excited about those goals and really driven to them is a massive way. Is a massive strategy to reduce aging across all of these things. Yeah. And you might be if you're the best, and if you're the best rower in the world, and you stop rowing, you've got nothing else to do. But you suddenly find you can run, and you actually you're fresh at running. Yeah. You, you can suddenly start training the same amount. I.e. Um, James Cracknell, who we all know. Yeah. But, yeah. He started doing endurance, um, his super big endurance events, didn't he? Well, he, he started. He, I mean, his whole point was he said, "Well, my back and um, my uh, my back and leg um, quads from pushing are knackered from all this rowing, but my legs for running and poundage are fresh as anything." Yeah, that's yeah. what he's early. That's what he started off saying in the marathon. And you go, yeah. what? That's probably not. A, and you look at the r- people who run for years and years, and they've got knee troubles. Yes. Yeah. Kind of, you get. Um, and and I've got lots of, and we all have lots of friends, etc., who are runners for whom stop running and really struggle to find other sports. Yeah. And it's that finding yeah. another sport that makes you excited that is fairly key, um, as it is, you know, as as is keeping your mental alertness up and running you know re- reaction times does slow down as you get older yeah actually that's on my list as well what i've got a little question about um well let's look at mobility first so why do we get why do we lose mobility what is it within the connective tissue like your ligaments and your tendons that or, or is that not the case i mean is because you do you see yeah. see obviously, <clears throat> the obvious things like you'll see um, people becoming more rounded as they get older but that's more down to um, the collapse in the spine is, um, I think I'm right. It's just the, the, the spine drops, the, the um, disc between the spine shrink, and and you get so you can lose height by a couple of inches over, you know. Oh over no! The last few years. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, you're in trouble, son. Andy, yeah. Andy, 
Yeah. Oh, that's not that's not possible. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, it, interesting enough, what, what you're talking about there is it, sometimes what people call the osteoporotic hunch. Yeah. Um, and actually, it is a, a, a significant reduction in bone mineral density, which can often lead to, to effectively just postural problems. Now, right. if you then layer on top of that a reduction in muscle mass, which yeah. you see with aging, a reduct, and, and that leads therefore to a reduction in strength, and so therefore strength endurance is actually that postural problem which can be skeletally linked. So hard tissue linked is also soft tissue linked. So th these yeah. things sort of come together. But I think you know, what's generally interesting is that you think about what happens is, you know, so let's talk about muscle function, for example. You know, muscle strength is lost. Because muscle strength is lost, muscle power is lost. Remember, power yeah. is force per unit time. You lose yeah. strength, you lose power. Because of those two, and actually linked with mitochondrial size and density, oxidative enzymes, you actually lose muscle endurance. Yeah. Um, and alongside that, again, associated with those two things is what then happens is, and, and, and interestingly here that you lose balance and mobility. Yeah. That balance and mobility may actually be linked uh, in part to what's called neurodegeneration. So okay. what's going on in the brain. So right. we know that we've got neurodegeneration, which is linked to things like uh, a reduction in neurogenesis, the production of new cells within the brain which then leads to an increased cognitive alterations which are going on that'll affect balance and mobility therefore motor performance and control is lost if we then add on top of that things like flexibility uh, and joint range of motion are yeah. also reduced as we get old so how and, why and, are they reduced though why, why, what happens well, there because because for a whole host of reasons really i, I guess you know to some extent it, it, there is an element and, and this probably is the, the, the key message from what we're talking about today, and that is use it or lose it. Right. Okay. Is that is that as we age, what we tend to do, this wonderful sort of dogma that we have in society is oh as you're getting older, oh just do a little bit less. Yeah, oh, you exactly. Don't want, I hate oh, that. you don't want to be doing that. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like watching a, a pregnant woman doing exercise and being vilified by the people. So oh, you shouldn't be exercising when yeah, you're pregnant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly the same. You walk into a gym and you see an old person on a bit of kit. And, and, and there are other people looking at them going, oh, we shouldn't be doing that. Oh, let's go and yeah. help them, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's that sort of attitude, oh, do less. When actually, as we age, the critical thing that we should be doing as we get older is doing more. Oh, yeah, totally. So absolutely, totally driver. So, so you've got this this sort of socio, sort of sociological impact on, on what people do. They're doing less. They're, they're much less active. And and in being much less much less uh, active, they're obviously losing muscle mass, losing strength, losing joint range of motion. You add on top of that things that, that are going on that if you don't, as with any training, the bottom line is that, that we know this, that, that we've got with progressive overload, we get adaptation. But as soon as we, we remove that, you get reversibility. Mm. So, you know, you, I, listen, I'm sure we're all the same. <laughs> I have to work at range of motion and flexibility on a continual mm. basis because mine is bloody dreadful. That has always has been dreadful. You know, particularly lower limb, upper body, not too bad. But that means you have to train it constantly. Yeah. So, and, and so the idea is that oh, as we get old, we should just keep it. Just you know, for some reason, should just. Well, no, of course you don't. You either use it or you lose it. And so therefore, you've yeah. got to keep training that. But then, you know, underpinning that, we come back onto something like collagen. Is that what we're doing? Is is we've got this reduction in collagen, which means the integrity of soft tissue. Uh, around ligaments, joint, uh, around joints and so ligaments and tendons, and within the muscle itself, is going to be reduced as well. Mm. So there's, as we age, there's lots of things that are conspiring to lead to that reduction in functional capacity. Right. Okay. <clears throat> but but the the key message here around all of these things, you know, VO two is going through the floor, uh, strength, power, mobility, flexibility, body weight has changed, metabolism is changing, exercise physical activity can reverse all of those mm. it is without any shadow of doubt the magic bullet yeah. that can reverse all of those aging processes i've got a good little uh, anecdote actually just, just, which, I'll, yeah. which i'll share with you sorry just, be, just a quick one um, i've got a friend of mine uh, years ago his, his dad used to cycle um he was 90 92 his dad used to cycle everywhere and him and his mum were constantly on his case and you're too old to cycle. You shouldn't be cycling. He'd been doing it for years. He had this old bike. He used to, he was just, you know, he used to go, go around town and eventually he listened to them and, get, and gave up cycling. And uh, again, it's only anecdotal, but he, he didn't, he wasn't around for much longer after that, a couple of years. 
And you think, I just wonder that because he, he became a lot less active just by yeah. the fact that he couldn't anymore because he was cycling every day and then he stopped cycling, sat on the sofa and he didn't seem to move from the sofa. And then a couple of years later, he was gone. And I was always that was stuck in my mind. So I was thinking, basically, you pestered him off the bike. <laughs> He's happy. Perfectly yeah. happy cycling. He was doing a, you know, a pretty good job of it. And then, you know, I just wonder how much of a part that was. I'd say it's quite a big part. Yeah. I mean, my take on, on the ageing and much of this is that, you know, we, we get better from childhood to ad, to adolescence to adulthood and it starts falling off. Right. Yeah. And it starts falling off at some point because you've absolutely got no choice about it. But for other people, it's because they just haven't done anything. Yeah. Um, in some people who keep active in certain sports, they will keep a range of motions and certain types of muscles quite good. But it, running behind that is that if you're a runner, your cardio stuff will be pretty good. Um, your up and down, you know, r- running in straight lines will be pretty good. But you, you'll be, there'll be a whole load of stuff that is deteriorating like any other 40, 50 year old. And at yeah. some point yeah. that starts coming into play. You're, it, it, you, of course, you get less um, flexible as that. Uh, you'll, you'll get, you may get less flexible by the very activity you're doing. When you then try to you put a package in to compensate all of that, it's absolutely enormous yeah. because you can't do one thing without having taken care of some part of the others, of which when as people get older, trying to accommodate all of those if they want to keep the performances of when they were younger becomes almost impossible about the amount of time they've got to do and the, and the, and the system, and how systematic they have to be to all of their training to cover all those different bits where it then becomes ex- incredibly complicated. Yeah. So you kind of have to accept there's going to be some, that, that bit in your mind going, well, the, the, the ageing process has got a whole load of biological factors that are going against me. And you haven't got a choice in that, but you have got a choice in the rate and you have got a choice in some of the areas. And you and whatever age you are, if you say, well, next, if, if I did this much today, next week, I could probably do the same or a tiny bit better you can start keeping a sense of progress. And if we, if you hold on to that type of mindset and then start identifying the different bits where whether you, you know, whether you want to get stronger or flexible in your hamstrings and your hips and so on, you can push a little bit further. That mindset of not, of not getting to the point, I used to do that when I was younger, I can't do it now. That, yeah. the 90 year old is an example of, the, of, of what is, I think is wrong with how we advise the old people. Yeah. We, can get to, we can get to how we are when we're watching old people. It's kind of when you go to an old people's home or, or an old person's house, and they say, I'll make you a cup of tea. And you go, thank, thank you. And then you hear the tea shake. So this is not just me shaking across. I'm four or three months old. As a freak, shaking across, <laughs> shaking across. And what exactly you do is you get up and help them. You go, oh, no, you sit down. <laughs> and what you really should do is let them. That's their, that they're. Their physical activity is getting up and putting the kettle on, yeah, getting up yeah. and turning the jam. No, jar. I'll do that. I'll do that. You sit down. So you're doing yeah. them a disservice by it's, doing that. You're making, you are doing that. I totally agree. For yourself, not for them. Yeah. Um, and that they need all those little physical activity opportunities they can get. Otherwise, they'll just they sat and did nothing. Um, I think that was me yesterday. But um, re- <laughs> reading about this podcast, um, you, it's thoroughly unhe- unhealthy. Thoroughly yeah. unhealthy. So, so the, uh, the aging process, I think, is so captured in year, in how many years you've sat down doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. So yeah. Rather, so you, if you know, we can talk about what activity you did, but actually, would better still, is how long have you spent sitting down, um, doing very little? And are the the youth who are in their you know in their twenties now and so on, they they're gonna they will be able to say, well, I spent ten years on on social media by the time they're fifty. When yeah. They at the time they've stared <laughs> stared at their phones, or, or playing computer games, sat on the backside for scary, hours on end. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is it is quite scary that. So if we if we stay with that whole um, kind of loss of well, bring it into cognition. So when when you what what happens in the brain um, that causes this kind of loss of? I mean, I definitely can feel it now. I mean, I'm, I'm what 50, 52 next. I can uh, I, the, the amount of times I get senior moments now compared to what I used to you know walking into a room and going shit what, what was it what was it what was I wanted the amount of times that happens now when it didn't used to so what's going on in the brain that causes this kind of cognitive decline well I mean is it is it is it a decline or is it one is it is it a case of having so much to select through and is it a case of capacity oh, when okay. you were when you were younger you didn't have that many things on your mind so you said well well we're going into a meeting going in to see your family now so you see your cousins 
you're going into family now, you see your cousins, you've got all, all what the cousins doing, all the all what the jobs of those are doing. There's loads of things going on. You've got your job going, running through your mind and all those other things. It, it's In some cases, it's a, it, we have a struggle to prioritise what we need to be thinking on. And oh, interesting. So, you know, it's all the forgetting of names. Well, you know, you know, I was fine of capturing names when I was a school teacher because I only had to one. I had to go into school and learn the names of people. But now I, I can I bump into people. I go, well, and they'll say, I know you from running. All right. OK, well, at least that's narrowed it down because <laughs> I've got about five or six compartments where I see people in. I know I know where they are. But at this current stage, I couldn't I, I need the compartment down. Well, that I don't, you, know, you can say, well, that's not necessarily your memory. That's the that's the complexity of the schemas you've got. And to some degree, the length of time it took to to actually um, to um, prime those. Because you can get into if you get into if you got into a conversation with a friend at school, you'd go, oh, yeah, dear, you struggle. Within a very quick period of time, you'd be remembering the times when, um, well, well, you know, when you were wall, when Tim Voss was caught wall walking, climbing across the top, yeah. all those, <laughs> and all your friend, the friend, you'll get back into these situations where 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 you prime your memory, and then your memory will be able to prime it. Um, I think we judge our cold memories on no priming. And we right. harsh, but then that's it's harsh on ourselves, and we call them senior moments. Be, and we have those because when you got when you're absolutely full of information. That's it. That's the other part is is people are, are quite inactive. So the idea that you your brain's deteriorating, well, it might be deteriorating if you're not having to remember anything. And we all now rely on sat 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 naps or phones to drive us everywhere. Yeah. And so our short term memory is shocking. It's pretty much shot to bit because we don't need to use it very much. So we don't, so we don't, we don't need to stop and go, OK, end, turn left, turn right, 400 metres and re- try and remember six things. We did used to, we did previously. Yeah. And we used to, and we used to do it. And yeah. We used to do it. And we used to hold it in there. And, and um, you know, uh, we don't, our short term memory is largely forgotten about. And you, you look at the, um, the work, the work on the Z generation, because, I've been doing some more teaching and I'm just kind of trying to work out who my audience is who all sit there looking at phones. Well, the Z generation research says this group of people um, who are still young are terrible at memory, uh, ter- have terrible memories, but they have very good ways of accessing the information. They know mm. the route to it brilliantly, yeah. so they don't bother remember it, remembering anything. Yeah. Which explains why they don't take notes, don't need to take notes. They know the route to it. They know the keywords to find. So the, their short term memories are, are and so on. It's kind of so they're not they're not trying to stuff information in their heads. They're getting a, a blueprint across the computer from how to how to do it. We are we are, I mean, we are judging in some degrees our ability to memorize things based on trying to remember stuff. When actually it may well be that um, you may in 30 years time, come and comes in, you've put your phone up to scan them. The, the phone will scan them. And it will connect to where you remember them from and send up their uh, send up their not <laughs> their details of them a bit like a name badges. Yeah. Um, and so on. <clears throat> I, think, um, I, think, I think what's what's really interesting in that, Andy, is that, you know, all, all this plays into the same message, really, in a sense, is that actually what, what we do when we're younger is really, really important. You know, we've spoken about it with bone mineral density leading into to menopause. Actually, how you come into menopause is really, really important. You know, we, we talk about how active we are when we are young. You know, the crucial thing is that we know that what's going to happen is we're going to get reduction of bone mineral density post menopause. So where we start off will dictate where we get to. Well, the same thing is true about muscle mass. We know that we're going to get an inexorable decline in muscle mass. And so therefore, if we if we come into that period of life with with good muscle mass, then it will take longer. Now, that, that decline is is the same. But what we and, and what we can do is one of two things. One is we can ensure that we're at a higher level before we start that inexorable decline. And then what we can do is we can intervene at that point to reduce the slope of that decline. So what we can do is, you know, from from that perspective, the interesting thing is that as we age, what we do get is we get neurodegeneration, okay, an increase in the rate of neurodegeneration, um, because there's a reduction in neurogenesis, uh, and, yeah. and so and so therefore what we get is we get cognitive alterations. But if you're if you're coming into that period of time where you, you, your short-term memory is shot anyway, 
then all of a sudden you're going to reach that point of which you can't remember anything in the short term much, much quicker. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is that what we can do then is therefore at a younger age is be much more proactive about how we're working on that short term memory, how we teach the way in which we teach, what we provide students and how we do that. And actually the way that we, we function generally in life. But, it, but interestingly enough, in terms of that rate of slope reduction is that what, what exercise does is actually exercise increases the release of what we call growth factors. So it, it, in particular, the release of, of brain derived uh, neutrotrophic factor, BDNF, is increased during exercise. And so therefore, what we can do as we start to age is, yes, there's going to be gen degeneration, but we can slow that rate down. And yeah. so therefore, two, two things to think about is, number one, how we come into old age really matters. And then also, once we're in old age, what we do also really matters. And so therefore, for me, the process of aging is lifelong. You know, we, we start to age at the moment of conception. That's what happens. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. that process starts. And so therefore, the idea, you know, and, and, you know we chatted about this earlier, but the idea that, that, do you know what, I'll worry about aging when I, you know, when I take my pension. I'll wait till I'm yeah. 65, which, you know, by the time me and Andy <laughs> retire, it'll be about 105. Um, but I'll wait till that point before I do anything about it. Utterly erroneous. Yeah. We have to, yeah. We have Couldn't to, agree we more. have to t attack the uh, aging process as early as possible mm. through lifestyle in order to improve. And remember, this is not about, and again, we, we're sort of obsessed with length of life. It's not about, yeah. it's not about length of life. It's quality. about the quality of that life. It's totally the, agree. It, rather than years of life, it's life in those life in years. years. Yeah, that's you know. my motto. That's my motto. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so, is is there any? I mean, of, apart from the obvious benefits of exercise, I always get this this vi visualization of it being almost a a good thing to be pushing blood through the body at a high rate. Um, you know, so like improving the circulation because it just it might it might be based on nothing other than a kind of fanciful idea that pushing blood around and getting the circulation to all of, all the corners of the body is a good thing. But I know it just is, is there any truth in that? I mean, in, in terms of things like I did hear that it, it, you're much less likely to get plaque build up on your in your in your blood vessels because if your heart rate is obviously pushing through occasionally when you train really hard, you get black, almost like a jet wash through of the the blood vessels i hope that's true <laughs> um well that, it sounds that, a little that, bit good too good to be true yeah and also get just getting blood to the to the brain a bit you know it, it, the circulation through to the brain a lot better i think i mean are that, is that is that a nice idea or is it just an idea it's a, it, it, a nice idea but probably just just coined slightly incorrectly okay um, i mean i think what, what's really interesting is like if you if you imagine a vessel so imagine yeah. your artery uh, yep. On the inside of that artery, you've got this what's called an endothelial layer. Okay, yep. it's one one cell thick, and that endothelium is really important because that endothelium is number one. It's responsible for protecting. Uh, if we damage that endothelium, lots of things will damage it, but particularly things like high circulating glucose, uh, smoking, uh, and, and, as well as things like trauma, can damage that. And, and once you damage that endothelial layer, the potential for infiltration into the arterial wall. Uh, is increased and so therefore that's where you get atherosclerosis or or, right. uh, or within the coronary arteries or actually peripherally around the body um so so critically making sure that we reduce the potentials or the, those things that could potentially damage that endothelium really really important right now as well as that what that endothelium does is it's responsible for the contraction expansion of the of the um of the artery okay yeah. really really importantly and what we do know with aging is that we, that vascular function, as we call it, is reduced with aging. Um, right. Now, we've done some lovely studies where we, we do some brutal things to people. Um, and uh, <laughs> you can do this thing called flow-mediated dilatation. So what we do is, we, so around the arm, for example, we can actually take a look at how the, the brachial artery is, is working by shutting off the blood flow to it. And then what we do is we release blood flow to it instantly. And this is exactly what you're talking about, Lee. And that is that when when you get an increase in shear stress, so you get a yeah. lot of blood being pushed through it. Yeah. What it does, it actually stimulates that endothelium and causes potent vasodilation. Right. Um, now, as we age. Is that occlusion worse. training? Is that the that occlusion training? Well, that, 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 that's part of the, the occlusion Similar. training, actually. The occlusion training is actually about ischemic load. 
All right. So it's basically about, you know, if you're going to do bicep, what you do is you reduce blood flow to that bicep. Yeah. The bicep during that exercise become more ischemic. And, yeah. and that then that then drives the the adaptive response of the right. muscle to a greater like degree. So different. slightly different. Yeah. Um, but but you know what you're saying is really interesting because really the message is right. And that is, look, if you can get blood increased blood flow uh, on a regular basis, then that is wholly positive for physiologic function and reduction in disease. Excellent. So, it, 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 <laughs> I'll yeah, take so that. It, it, the mechanism is different, but actually what you're saying is absolutely right. Right. Good. Lovely job. Um, right. So if we've, if we've kind of gone through the basis of, of aging and the physiological effects and we've touched on the psychological effects, um, I, I don't know whether it's worth just just touching quickly on on the on Alzheimer's d dementia, which is obviously age. Is, is it purely age related? Or can, I know it can, you can get early onset as well. But what's going on there it, it, w w that, that's that's age related? Can you shed any light on that, Andy? Or well, just... I, I, that's a really complex one. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's probably a podcast in itself. But I mean, OK, certainly... if, if it is too complicated, we can leave it for now. No, no, not really. I, you know, it's, it, I, I think the, the thing to remember is multifactorial. Uh, yeah. There are genetic influences, things like the APOE gene. So APOE gene um, appears to be linked to it. Um, it is age related. Um, it's also associated with things. So you get things called vascular dementia. Yeah. Um, so so where you've got as we've just been talking about actually where you get damage or disease within the within the vessels that are feeding the brain blood yeah uh, then that can that can lead to things like vascular dementia um and, and so aging has got a, 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 is associated with it what we now know very importantly is actually that lifestyle has a profound impact uh, so we keep on, coming back to outcome. this don't we we keep going yeah, of course yeah and, and that's the, what's fascinating about this is the is we keep coming back to the same thing just just exercise and eat better <laughs> it, you know and it's going to give you a massive massive age protecting benefit i mean well, stop, physical stop, activity stop, stop, stop yes smoking, yeah. alcohol reduction stress reduction you know all those things that we always talk about about healthy lifestyles yeah perfect yeah. Um, it's not just exercise though it's exercising for half an hour a day and sitting for 23 and a half hours a day is not is is no, also totally very misleading yeah, no, you're right. Active and and uh, a whole of our lifestyles are geared to do to sitting on the floor, where you know sitting down. When actually we should, you know, as you get older and you've got more time to do things, it, it's, it, it can be very easy just to do sit and do nothing. Yeah. And so actually having that mindset of I'm still going to do stuff, even if it's a hoovering and so on and so forth, but keeping moving all of the time is quite good. That you know, Greg does that. If you stand up once an hour, you switch on the fat gene. That's right. Yeah. Of which that's really important as muscle deteriorates with as people getting older, their risk of getting of staying the same weight, but being a bag of, of being a bit more fat and a bit less muscle as a yeah. bit of bone is is really worrying because it starts to fitness starts deteriorating. And he, what you get from that is that cy cycle, which you haven't really got into, is how people lose motivation to do anything. And yeah. They lose motivation to do things partly because their standard of what they achieve deteriorates. Or the first time they do something, it feels much harder than what they remember. And the a mindset that says I'm now too old, which is prevalent, says, well, actually, I shouldn't I, sh I shouldn't do this. As a, And it's then that, that is really complicated in terms of how people can change it. But but partly it is is that is the, the starting off is saying is it's really good for me to be motivating at something. What can I do? Mm. And, for older people, st starting a new sport, bizarrely, I think is good advice. Yeah. You haven't got that comparison against your 30, 40, 20 teenage self. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. So I have runners who say, I want to do under t under sub 18. And I'm looking at them, I'm going, you're, you're 50 or do you? There is no hope of this happening because you're <laughs> too. Why don't you do a sport? You know, if you, you you're that would be a 90 percent age related performance. Why yeah. don't you go and that's unrealistic. You couldn't do that when you were 18 anyway. Yeah. Or that age anyway. You <laughs> never never done. Part, so why, <laughs> why do you think you can do it now? But yeah. Because that's their sport. But if they went and did another sport, then they would find that they'd be much higher up that ranking uh, or much. They don't have that comparison to go against. So it's finding op 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 finding opportunities to do so. And, there, and I think social media is full of them for, for, and picks up people who are starting exercise in their 50s and 60s. Which is quite good, and that, which is which is because they then 
the you know the plank challenge is going on in social media now and mm. spots challenge and the and th- those things are good for people to go along with and and not to think i can only do one but they can do as many as they want and get the other part to all of this is have a good social com- social network where yeah. someone yeah. says i did a plank for for a minute if your comparison group is a group of all a group of ex athletes they go yes <laughs> plank for a minute yes <laughs> and some 70 year old says, yeah, I did one for 10 minutes yesterday. And the unheard of comparisons, which 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 ultimately um, can belittle you in terms of where, where you're at with your progress, it's it's finding that goal for you to go for so that you you don't lose motivation. Uh, and it's, you, you, and you get rare glimpses of people who are really motivated, very old. And we often see them as outliers in terms of their, their oddballs. But actually, all they're doing is pursuing something with intensity. Mm. And quite often, what they're doing is they might be 80-year-olds doing marathons. But they're, in essence, they're walking them. Yeah. But that's, you know, if you can walk, why not pursue that as a possible a possibility? If you can ride yeah. without falling off, why not pursue that as a possibility? But bike riding is a bit riskier. But it's just yeah. a, it's that encouragement and the s- challenging that societal almost norm that this is not for you to do. And it kind of, well... Says who is the end. <laughs> yeah. Says well, you, who. You, you just brilliantly answered my last question, actually, which was about losing. Why do we lose interest in keeping fit as we get older? And that you've answered it pretty much that it's not necessarily that. It's that the, you're kind of almost pushed not to do it by society. Well, yeah, but we, we kind of want to keep fit, but we feel that we can't keep fit. Um, we feel like we, we, we're going we age is getting is going to have this deteriorating effect. But actually, you want to drive it down so that if, if if you do, if you ran a mile in 12 minutes one week and you had a couple of days rest and then you tried it again, you could probably do 11, 40, 1150. Yeah. And, and therefore you can progress. Yeah. And if you had a bit more rest, you could probably do 1148. And after yeah. six weeks of conditioned training where you go, oh, I've got a bit of a few sore hips. So you do some exercises for them, counter movements, which are deteriorating. You're suddenly mm. down to 1030. Yeah, yeah, and you so. and you get that sense of progress. And yeah, I think it's never too late for that. We do. Never I, too I late think for also, that. yeah, what what we should never, you know, I mean, what, what's really important though is that, that society is changing. Mm. You know, and I think that expectation piece is changing. And, and what what you know, you go down to a gym. You know, I was at the gym this morning. You go to the gym now. It's actually a really nice space. Uh, yeah. For any mm. for any age where you can go in there. You know, if yeah. I think about the days that when, you know, when I was an elite athlete, I used to go down the gym and it was full of meatheads. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, 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 you know, and there's a, a, a 70 year old woman, you would never go to the gym. Are you crazy? You know, it's yeah. not a place for you. Yeah. Whereas now, actually, I think that, that, that what, sociologically, we've changed our attitudes and the provision of facilities to make it much more accessible, number one. And I think for me, you know, what Andy's talking to as well is this, this idea of making it social. Mm. is to actually yeah. you know make it make it fun make it enjoyable and i think what again what what we see now at the gym you know and uh, within the, the sort of fitness and leisure sector is that group you know class activity an awful lot of, of older people go to that class because it is part of their social circle 100 percent. you know they happen mm. to be doing you know whatever whatever it is that they're doing when they're there they're mm. very active but they're there for a chat and a coffee afterwards. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so it, it's actually about making it part of lifestyle and, and remembering that it is never, never too late no. uh, yeah. to change lifestyle. And any change in lifestyle will have a positive, uh, a positive effect without yeah. any shadow of a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. We'll, we'll wind it up in a second. I, I, so we're just getting towards the hour now, which is great. But I just wanted to touch on one one other um, couple of things. Just about we've we've if people have listened to this and they haven't taken away that we advocate <laughs> exercise, strength training, mobil mobilization, then they haven't been listening really. So we don't need to go over that again. <laughs> but um, there's one question that I've, I've I've had and it's never really been fully answered. It's that why there's such a high level of um, you know, people 100 plus in Japan, in Okinawa, and you hear about these stories about certain locations around the world where they just seem to have a, an absurdly high level of people very, very fit and able in, into their 90s and 100s. Um, in me, is it purely down to think you hear things like fresh vegetables, certain about, you know, variety of fresh vegetables and foods and fish? And, you know, is it as simple as that? Or is there something more going on there? Well, <laughs> see, 
I did some research onto this question prior to okay. coming to this. And when you look into pop into J Japanese research into Japanese populations, there is a big contrast between those who are active and those who are inactive. Okay. So, um, what you've got is the effect of, of being active for what seemingly the effect of people being active for much longer and he living, eating a healthier diet. In other words, this preventative approach kicking it's shown being shown at the top end of age. Right. Okay. And for those who have not done it, you don't seem to get any difference. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's partly disentangle the stats. Japan have got a very, very have not have got a very low birth rate. Um, but then getting into the details of the older age and then compare its Japanese samples with themselves. It's the healthier ones, as in those following being more proactively healthy, are living longer. Right. And, and not and having a better quality of life along with it. Because that is the cliff effect, isn't it, typically with exercise? You have high quality of life and it drop your it drops off at the end, as yeah. opposed to a gradual slope of of um, your quality of life deteriorating as you get older to the point where you've got no quality of life and then you die. Exercises, you exercises are are good quality of life, and suddenly die. Or oh, that's quite a, one of the trends, anyway. Yeah, that's I want to die. I want to die on the bench press at 94. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's 94 I mean, years old, isn't it? Yeah, 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 94 <laughs> kilos. I'll take not, it. Not 94 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, that's it. But that, that, that's the important point that Andy makes about that that what we call the period of morbidity. You know that that you know as we get older, there will be a period where we die, uh, and we'll die for various different reasons. But what we want is that 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 period of morbidity to, to be as short as possible, yeah, and also as late as possible. Mm. Uh, what what we don't want to do is you know spend fifteen years dying. Yeah, hundred percent. You know because we are all going to die. That's the, the nature of it. Um, I think the interesting thing about stats and comparative stats between nations about length of life is that one of the things that we never like to talk about, but that is about socioeconomic status yeah. look if you live mm. in a if you, if you are deprived and, and interesting you know within population so you take a look at the uk and you look at the length of life predicted length of life from low socioeconomic status up to up to the the rich it's, it's a direct linear relationship yeah. but the same is true of nations uh, you know compare central africa with the uk it looks like we're doing a, a, a great job uh, compare us against a very affluent uh, population but then Layered on top of that is the sociology of it is actually, you know, at what's the rate in this country, type 2 diabetes rising by 500 new cases yeah. a day. It's terrifying. We've got, we've got some of the fattest people in the world in this country when, in, when it comes to obesity prevalence. Yeah. We've got some of the most inactive uh, uh, individuals per population compared to, you know, 11 million people doing less than 30 minutes of activity in a week. You know, all of those things, if you, if you then take a look at what the Japanese are doing, where actually culturally, it's an amazing place every time I've been there, is that you see the parks full mm. of people being physically active late, very late into life, you know. And so, you know, alcohol consumption, smoking prevalence, ex, you know, all again, and stress and all those things about healthy lifestyle. What you've got to be very careful about is saying, oh, because they're Japanese. Actually, yeah, it's yeah. not. It's about all of those things which are modifiable. There are lifestyle modifiable factors that you can that you can adopt that will reduce that rate of aging, that will compress uh, that period of morbidity towards the end of life and yeah. therefore improve not only length, but also quality of life. Yeah. Right. Well, that's a lovely way to wrap it up. It is. Thank you, gentlemen. That was um, always um, it's always a great um great chat with you guys so appreciate your time again but the, the one, just to, just to say the one thing i took out of that though that, which i am a bit worried about is the fact that that you said that andy is going to get even shorter uh, that, that to me don't mate he's that, already falling off the screen it's already dropping off the screen <laughs> look at him so he's getting shorter as we speak yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, fellas. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to stop the recording, but please don't shoot anywhere. I just want to have a, I just want to say goodbye to you after yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. It was excellent. Yeah. Absolute pleasure. It was brilliant. Pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode of Mature Muscle, please subscribe and find us on most social media. Until next time. Stay shredded.